Hello, this is Hana at Dub Lab Studio in Los Angeles. Welcome to a new installment of the arts, music, and new tech podcast series started by Your Mom's Agency. Together with Your Moms in Berlin, we have relaunched the Experimental Music Exchange platform, EXP, under the patronage of Wunderbar Together. Today we present to you a recap of the first EXP workshops by Tokyo-based artist and producer, Slee. We have made the workshop PDF document available to you in the EXP group on Facebook. And now, let's learn from Slee first about mixing and mastering, and then about remixing in the second part of this episode. I'm a music producer. I used to release on some UK labels before, like uh, Civil Music, Ninja Tune, etc., like quite a few years back. And then uh, I then moved on to, into more dance music. Uh, it first, it was, first it was like kind of abstract music. Then it was dance uh, territory. I played at festivals like um, Ultra Japan and uh, Outlook in Asia, Ultra Korea. Um, just quite a few more like uh, almost EDM sphere. Even though I wasn't making EDM, the EDM people liked what I was making, so they booked me for these kind of events back then. And then um, since 2017, I, I just moved into producing other people rather than releasing my own music. So for the last four years, I've been producing most of the uh, a kind of like a bridge between underground and major in Japan. So I, I'd, one day I'd be producing some of the kind of uh, J-pop stars in Japan. And next day I'd be producing up and coming rappers that nobody's ever heard of and then trying to break them. So it's I find it fun to try to break artists. So that's what I've been doing for the last four years. And uh, so it's it's been actually the last four years been the busiest because I literally have been making one song a day uh, <laughs> for the for four years. <laughs> so I have thousands of songs. Uh, a lot of them are unreleased because I'm making them for stock. I just, I'm just creating stock to pitch to artists that I'm working with. But basically it's been one song a day for the last four years. And uh, a lot of them released, some of them hit, some of them didn't. So it's been good. So I guess that's my that's my credits. Oh yeah, and for international, I have I have a re- uh, some movies coming up, like music in a British film called um, uh, "People Just Do Nothing," which is a very famous, I think, British comedy show that's turned into a movie now. Um, and some stuff on Netflix, like uh, the Wu Assassins uh, series, and uh, pretty tiny tiny sorry pretty little thing pretty tiny things or something like that i forgot the name of the show that my music's been on but it's basically like these kind of also um and red bull toyota subaru uh casio g-shock um burton brands i also jeep uh, they use my music so um that kind of stuff first of all like difference between mixing and mastering i always hear people ask like oh how do you master your music and they mean mixing and then I hear people say like, oh yeah, is, is this mixed when they mean mastered? So I think most people don't really see, understand the difference between mixing and mastering. So uh, you can't really mix or master a song unless you understand what the difference is. So f- the difference is that mixing is basically like um, you, you work with a bunch of st- individual tracks, uh, individual sounds like kick, snare, hi-hats on a drum kit, guitars, bass, piano, and you're trying to balance them between each other so that they all sound like one coherent song instead of uh, working with um, one sound. So you're basically working with a bunch of different sounds and you're trying to blend those sounds so they're they're mixed well. That's mixing. Mastering is working with one file, only one file. So that's the, the, the actual song. And that's the file that uh, is sent to the engineer so with mixing when you're sending files to the engineer you're sending you're sending about it could be 30 could be 100 files 100 different individual sounds that the engineer will then try to turn into one a whole coherent and that's mixing uh, mastering will be engineer working with one file 
and they and it's the last final touches they're just trying to make the song uh you know finalized radio ready as they used to say ready to be released into the world they're trying to it's the last chance to get rid of any kind of um noises any any kind of mistakes any kind of balance mistakes that might be in the in the file the mastering engineer will try his best to do that and also mastering engineer will try to his best to make sure as as one file as one song it just sounds good in comparison to all the other songs that are playing on the radio or in a spotify playlist etc like so i'm going to go into file formats and and just the basic good practice for doing mixing uh so when you're producing music i think you should at right now in 2021 it's a good idea to produce in my opinion so it's it's not a rule it's it's, it's an opinion but at at 48 kilohertz is the setting that you should choose in your in your workstation um because reason being is that a lot of video uses 48 kilohertz rather than 44 so if if there's any chance that uh, a TV or movie might want to use your music, of course they'll use the 44 anyway. But it's better if you have 48, just just for the sake of it. My my opinion it, is you know people argue about this all the time, so <laughs> I don't want to I don't want to start any fights. But I I prefer 48 kilohertz, and that's what I recommend. And then and then uh, your settings in your DAW allow for 16, uh, 24, and 32 bit. And um, you should have a setting called 32-bit or 32-bit float. So always choose 32-bit unless you have a really weak computer. Because 32-bit uh, uh, will prevent trouble in the long run. It's, it's, it it uh, prevents sounds from clipping and distorting. And engineers can use that to, to kind of better standard. So your settings should be 48 kilohertz. 32-bit and and that's your DAW settings uh, for almost everything you should be doing in 2021 um, yeah so like uh, I've, I've, I've actually made it I tried to make it as short a list as possible of what you should be thinking about when you're sending your files to a mixing engineer and uh, even though you're not mixing your music yourself there's some there's kind of kind of a mixed mindset that you need to have when you're actually making your music regardless of what you're doing whether you're playing guitar just recording it recording your own voice and there's one thing that you cannot avoid and that's number one and that's gain staging you should always be gain staging everything that you do so gain staging is a really long topic so take a note google it after watch some youtube videos about what gain staging actually is but to make put it simply when you take a sound and you put something on it, like let's say distortion or reverb or EQ, the sound after you put something on it should be the same volume as before, as when that it was when you before you put something on it. So always, you know, put it on, mute it, and un unmute the effect. Check that it's the same volume. So that's the very basic breakdown of what gain staging is. You don't want if you put something on your sound and it got louder. Uh, it will always sound better to you because it's louder, not because it's better. <laughs> I hope that's not confusing. Um, so the sound should not get louder, but it should be... So the sound should change, but not get louder. And that's the basic basics of gain staging. So you should always try to um, kind of, uh, you know, keep to the same volume for every individual sound within your project, right? Whether it's guitar or your voice... And this is a really good practice. If you if you do that all the time, every time you add a sound, every time you add EQ or effect or compressor, any effect, this uh, you this will make sure this will actually really help you get a good sound very fast. And this is something that most people don't read about, don't learn about, and this is why their music doesn't sound as good in the end. So for me, that's number one. I think this, uh, and and your engineer will thank you because you did it. Um, Second thing they should consider before sending your files to the engineer is uh, so your none of your channels should go above zero. So if they go above zero, bring them down somehow. Find a way to bring them down um, because if it goes above zero, even if it's 32 bit and 32 bit uh, float actually allows for sounds to go above zero, but 
uh, is good practice to make sure it doesn't. It's just, it's, it's very good practice. It's something that you should always uh, be aware of. And their genres like uh, EDM and stuff, uh, or let's say like dub, uh, kind of heavy dubstep, where they they clip a lot, they go above zero a lot. But just as a general rule, uh, sticking to below zero is a much better idea. Um, number three, uh, and this is again in consideration of an engineer that will be working with your sounds after you have finished your finished your song. Um, it's good practice to always organize your project in a very logical order in in and always try to stick to the same order for your own sanity so every time you if your order is always the same and you have very good practice of organizing your projects really cleanly um it, it will help the engineer and it will also help you to kind of get around the project so in my case i start i have drums at the top baseline below it uh, m music folder below it uh, it's like a music tracks below it so anything that synths guitars everything of musical nature will be below it and um, and always the most important in those in that category the most important sound will always be at the top so the main lead synth would be that at the top the or lead guitar will be at the top uh, below that effects so sound effects like noises etc etc below that the vocals so i actually separate the vocals entirely from the track so that the song is one part of the project and vocals are a different part of the project. It's it's very easy to then mute the cappella or mute the track. Um, so this kind of like na numbering individual tracks but not the groups is for me personally, I think it was a very smart idea because it makes it easy to, for me to manage my files and for the engineer to get around my files. And everything I'm I'm actually talking about right now is in the PDF that I've made. So um, you can actually follow along. Uh, to export the files, super easy. Select the entire length of the song down to the last, very last sound plus extra because there might be reverbs and stuff at the end of the song. So give another like 20 seconds or so at the end of the song. And then export all the files at the same length. So when the engineer, same beginning, most important is that they begin at the same point. When the engineer, engineer grabs the files, um, he puts them in his project and they all line up perfectly. And this is how we all do it. And this is the way to do it. So number five, uh, you need to label the folder in a very coherent way. And this is something I see a lot. People People send you a file and it's like song. Or like demo one, and it, and it doesn't say the artist name, doesn't say anything. It just says demo one, and after two days, you have no idea whose song it is. So, um, be aware that people will never, people will never remember your file names unless you name them like they have no idea who you are. <laughs> even if it's your mother, she will have no idea who you are after like three days, even if she's a mastering engineer, right? So, um, basically. My way of uh, saving on of naming my files is artist name dash song name version number. I usually go v v fifteen or v fourteen v eleven something like that. So artist name song name v v something BPM uh, of the the tempo of the song uh, thirty two forty eight so that the engineer knows what uh, uh, bits bit rate in my um, so 32 bit 48 kilohertz but 32 48 is self explanatory to every engineer and then date at the end of the file so every time i do a recall on a file uh i i change the v number so v15 becomes v16 v17 by the end of, but when the track is done it's usually like maybe 20 versions very small changes very very small changes but um, you can always refer to it and then date. And this is the name of the folder with the mix files. This is, again, again it's in a PDF, so you can see how I actually name it. Um, and export your... I prefer WAV files, and I think most people prefer WAV files because WAV files are... Um, uh, they're more common than AIFF files. So AIFF files are Mac... They're predominantly they are Mac format 
So WAV files are more wide, widespread, so this is what I recommend. So WAV files, 32-bit, 48 kilohertz, and never send Mixing Engineer your MP3s, like ever. Just don't do that. <laughs> I know people who export multi-tracks in MP3s because they're trying to save Dropbox space. Just don't be that guy. Buy, buy Dropbox. Or something. Some find a way to you know deliver it by hand, but do, do not send MP3s um, ever. And uh, next thing that we have uh, number six. So you want to export uh, wet files. If you don't know what that is, that means whatever you did to the track. So you put some effects on it, EQ, compressor. Um, export wet and that means all effects are on every track but remove the master effects so if you have a master bus like the very final channel through which everything goes and you have something on there a lot of people put ozone or limiter on it remove that so that should not be on your master bus um, for when you're sending for, for mixing engineer um, unless you have like a compressor, maybe a small compressor is okay, but generally just to remove it. And uh, so this is good practice, like because most engineers will appreciate to receive the song that you were happy with and work from there, rather than try to reimagine the song that you you made. And this is just an opinion from engineers that I worked with. I asked them what they preferred. Most of them prefer to receive wet files, but some of them prefer to also have dry files, so files without effects on them. Um, so basically files with effects on are, uh, are the basic rule. And if you have time, and if you want to be very diligent about your files, also create a second folder with the same files but dry, so no effects. And your engineer can, if there's a problem with some of the sounds, your engineer can fix it for you. Um, Number seven, if you use buses, groups, uh, name them. I I said that earlier actually, but name them differently so they you they can be they can be easily separated from your multi tracks, because the engineer will usually listen to the bus how you've pros what you've done to it, but they will actually make their own after that with separate files. So, um, number eight. You want to provide uh, reference song files. And this is kind of a... It's, I don't know, some people don't do it. Some some engineers don't care, don't care about it. I find that when I provide uh, reference song files, the engineers more than half of the time actually use the reference song file. So the reference song file means a famous released song by a different artist which you kind of which is kind of close to what you're trying to do so unless you like a noise musician and sound like nobody else there must be something that's more or less somehow in a ballpark of what you're trying to do so uh just providing a song file mp3 or something is fine to the engineer and saying like this is kind of like what sounds like what i'm trying to do and uh, the engineer will actually refer to that and it's also a good idea to use that when you're making your music, you know, to at least hear how your music compares compares to like a released, uh, you know, that major artist project, for example. Um, number nine, and self-explanatory, but communicate with your engineer. So, like, you need to tell them what you want. If you don't tell them what you want, you will not get what you want because you will get what they think you want, and it's not going to be this something that you want usually. Um, be very clear if you have any requirements whatsoever don't be lazy write an email list it clearly don't go into a long long life story about uh, <laughs> why you made the song etc so just say like I want the bass to be like this the kick to be like this if you have preferences if you have no preferences and you absolutely don't care or super trust the engineer that's fine but I always find communication and communication is the best thing that you can do uh, finally, something you hear everybody say like all the time, and it's I, I I think it's ridiculous. Never say that it will be fixed when it's mastered. It will not be fixed. So people say like, oh, it's gonna be fixed when it's mastered. When they when they do a bad mix, and the song doesn't sound good, they're like, oh yeah, it's gonna be mastered, so it's fine. 
It's like it's not fine. It will not be fine when it's mastered. It will it will sound louder, but all st still terrible. So you you cannot. Don't ever say that. Fix the mix. Try to make it as good as you can. And this is what engineers are for. That's why you hire them. If you cannot make your a mix that you're really happy with, um, it will not sound perfect when it's mastered. And that's in in that case, um, consider hiring an engineer. Okay, so you have a mixed track. Either an engineer mixed it for you, or um, or you mixed it yourself, and you're like a, you're amazing at mixing, and you've done a really good job. You're happy, and you wanna do a uh, you wanna send a file to your mastering guy, mastering engineer. I I always recommend doing it, do, sending it to the mastering engineer. So to prepare files for doing that, um, make sure your mix again doesn't clip at zero. Like it's common sense and. It is very common sense, but I see people sending sausages. Uh, sorry, sausages a file that looks like uh, that has no <laughs> groove. <laughs> it just looks like one flat block. Uh, I see people sending that to a mastering engineer a, a, more than I should, even though it's common sense not to do that. And uh, so, good uh, thing to aim for is between six minus six and minus three on your fader in your DAW, whatever it is that you're working in. Minus three to minus six is a good area. This is common sense, so I'm not like, this is probably really boring if you, you already know it, but it's, it's just still, if you never heard of that, if, if there's a chance that you never heard this before, this is what you should be doing. Minus three to minus six dB is a good place to, to, to aim for, so never zero. And I don't mean lowering the fader to that position, I mean, that the meter, the little yellow bar that dances around when you're playing music, it should not go above minus three on this, on, on the meter. And uh, always provide the highest quality file. So some people go to a mastering engineer's website and they see, oh, you have 24 bit something something like is written on the website but quite often the websites are not updated for five to ten years so back then 24-bit was maybe the maximum file uh, always provide the best quality file that you can uh, that you've worked on so if you work in 32-bit 48 kilohertz that's how you export your music um, do not put do not put limiters or any kind of um, things that crush the sound at the end of the uh, mixing process unless you specifically know this is your sound but generally do not do that um, and so best file format um, without stuff on the master bus is a really good place to start again same as for mixing clearly label the file except that with mixing you provide a bunch of files and you label the folder with mastering, you, you actually label the file. And again, artist name, song name, version name, BPM, uh, 3248. Date, important. And uh, the engineer will, of course, know the difference. But still, just to make sure that they're not tired and not busy uh, to, uh, to kind of miss this part. Put the word pre-master in the quiet file. So the one that was minus three to minus six dB, the word pre-master should be in the file. It's easy for engineer. They will know, ah, ha, this is the pre-master. Um, pre-master means it's the file that was not mastered. It was before mastering. It does. It's not loud. It's the quiet file. So to create a good master, your file has to be pretty quiet. And minus three to minus six dB is quiet. So. This is something you should be aiming for. Um, second thing that I find good practice, these, these are not rules, this is my experience working with engineers, um, provide a rough master. So rough master is uh, something that you did yourself to make it louder. You know, like you put a, maybe a limiter on it or clipper or something, I don't know, just turned it up or something. I don't know, whatever you did to make it louder. That's the rough master, and that's maybe probably the one that you've been listening to on your in you know iPhone. Um, so provide that as well, so that they can hear what you've been happy with, and they can compare, and they can kind of try to see to please you in that way by by hearing what you like. Um, and in my case, 
uh, I'm, uh, you, again, you can see in PDF of what I actually have in my folder sent to the mastering engineer. The very last, um, the very last screenshot is a Slee, the corner for, Slee's my name, in case you missed that, the corner for mastering. <laughs> uh, I have um, something called rough master chain screenshots. So I actually take screenshots of every plugin that I had on my master. So if I really like my master, and I, I usually do. I usually ask the engineer to kind of like try to be close to what I did. I send them screenshots as well so that they can try to reproduce my sound and then make it better. Um, and then, uh, so th this was uh, one. And then uh, one other thing that I do that I found is very good practice is I usually drop in a couple of um, mp3s or if I have way, uh, WAV files WAV files of famous songs that uh, that I referenced when I was making the music so and here's some things that you look out to for and one thing I found the, s the most crucial thing I found mastering and mixing um, people's um, uh, master working with mastering and mixing engineers is I always aim to find an engineer you can talk to so there's, there are services online, online mastering services. Or like, oh yeah, upload 24 hours later, like you'll download. I find these are not, you never get a good, you maybe get a good result from it, but I find I, I didn't get a good result from it. So I always got better results from an engineer I can talk to. Uh, lastly, like it's, um, you know, like it's, I feel like it's really, it's, you feel, you create, because I recommend creating a personal relationship with your engineer and always try to kind of you work with two or three. Don't work with like a hundred, you know, like have two or three engineers that you like and just stick with them and uh, and they'll know your music better and better and they'll know what you like. You'll be quicker and easier the more you work together. Same for mixing engineers. At the same time, uh, and some people prefer to like really just like, oh, this is my guy and that's it. I prefer to master like three or four places simultaneously. I'll I'll send it to expensive place and to a cheap place, and to like a new guy. I'll just choose the one that sounded the best to me. ミホドラされる日々は終わりや。YouTube クラウドファンディング
Before we get into actual remixing of songs, I I have like a really I, an interesting question that I always have to ask is like what what makes a good remix, and I think it's it's very opinions differ like different people have different opinions what makes a good remix, but I think um, uh, the a good remix is a reinvention of the song that. Um, a good remix is, is the reinvention. It's like you're not you're not making a new song. You're taking the same song that already exists and you're reinventing it. So it's kind of like recomposing, rewriting the song to kind of be something new, to give the song a new kind of breath of life, to extend its lifetime in a way, and to help push the original song. So it makes sense for it not to be the same as the original song. It's like you want it to be something kind of different, maybe different tempo, different vibes. If it was dark before, make it bright. If it's bright before, make it dark. Something that just makes it kind of different or pushes it into a different genre to kind of like to basically uh, think of like less, it's, it's more, it makes the song more wide to a, uh, more accessible to a wider spectrum of audience. I think the biggest thing is like, how do you get your favorite artist to remix your song and also how do you get people asking you for remixes and i think there's a couple of ways to do it i mean to get your favorite artist to remix a song is actually fairly simple unless you're trying to reach people who are just way beyond in a different kind of sphere of existence which is uh you know that there are certain people who uh, they have so many gatekeepers that it's very hard to get to them directly 
but in most cases actually um uh you can if it's a fairly famous artist you can google their management saying like who's managing this person so google like you know like i don't know skrillex manager uh, and uh and you pr- you'll you probably find the manager and you just email the manager with um, your proposal or if it's somebody not that famous who's a little bit more accessible on social media simply asking them directly for to connect them to, to connect you with their manager like get for their manager's email is fine uh but also most many artists on on top of their social media they have they quite often have the emails of the managers so one thing i don't recommend is just talking to the artist directly about getting a remix done unless you know they they manage themselves so it's it's just polite to ask is like do you have a manager because you're really you're literally saving you 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 it's respectful to not try to waste their time by talking business if they have a person who's specifically there to talk business on their behalf. Another thing um, um, that you don't want to do, um, one thing that you really, that is really, I don't advise, is I don't advise you to do is uh, do not be one of those guys that emails people, yo, can you remix this and like no information just don't be that guy it's not polite it doesn't give you any information it makes it gives them extra work having to reply to you and ask you for things for details i find the best way to do it is be concise at, at the same time don't be the guy that sends a long life story email uh sends an essay about your feelings culminating in the fact that you do not have so much money but you want the remix like literally provide information i have a ep coming out i want a remix on this song uh could you please connect me with your manager or if you manage yourself what is your what are your conditions to do a remix and are you interested do you like this Is, is this something that's that's interesting for you and i'm looking forward to your reply thank you very much please get back to me soon etc et like the, the you know basic stuff like it's, it's, it's common sense but I, I, you'll, you'll be surprised how many people do not do this more importantly uh money talk uh so money talk is kind of like uh, it, it's very it's very it, it, it can really depend on the country you're in the label they're in uh, the label you are in uh, the management conditions of each of the sides uh how it's going to be published is it going to be used in a movie or not it's like there's all these different conditions that will start to apply when you're talking about uh, money when it comes to remixing but there's some kind of like more or less kind of common sense topics that you can expect and uh one thing that people often assume is that you can expect a 50 50 split on a remix that's not always the case in my experience um Especially if there's a vocalist on the track, quite often it'd be like a, it could be like a 33% split. If it's literally artist, 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 no management, no label. If the label is involved, the label will also take part of the cut. So actually, in many cases, uh, the label can take a 50% split off the track because they will actually own 50% of the track. It's like, in, at least in Japan, that, that, that's, that can be the case. So you actually end up splitting 50% to the label and 20% between you and artists, which is not really fair, but that's I've seen that happen. So there's these things to consider. So, But let's assume uh, you're an indie artist and you're talking to an indie artist who do not have a label. You release your own stuff um just through you know online distribution services which is which is a kind of a smart thing to do in 2021 because you get all the money uh and i've see i see in japan the kids that do not go to labels and do not uh, and just uh um they become the label themselves through their crew and release kind of like in, in in within a kind of close circle of friends they start releasing independently without actually running labels those kids make the most money right now they make more money than major artists in japan in japan at least and um and the reason being is that uh in at least in japan there's a service called TuneCore, which is the same as global but japan one inc- introduced splits so there you input the uh, email for each person involved in the track and uh and when the track starts selling 
you get the splits from each uh, each one gets like the percentage of the of the sales that you've in, you've input into the track. So you actually we're talking about not publishing splits. We're talking sales splits. So that's actually a really uh, interesting modern 2021 way of doing uh, remixes or collaborations. And globally, I know that DistroKid started doing that. So you can input your PayPal email, and you will get money tickling trickling into your account. Not tickling, but also kind of tickling. Trickling into your account. Uh, like Monthly, I think, yeah. Uh, and and it's, it's really cool because it makes it easy for everybody. Previously, prior to this, uh, many, independent, many independent artists actually didn't go for splits at all because it was too much work trying to work out quarterly splits for all of the things that they involved with over the years. So like, let's say they've done a bunch of remixes with different people and features. Somebody has to take care of calculating this, the 25% of your share for your track and all the other things that they've been involved with. So quite often... They took, um, they did remixes for a set fee, or for, um, you know, um, yeah, basically a set fee, and then no splits. That was uh, like quite often the case with independent artists. In 2021, uh, since 2019, I think in Japan, it uh, it it makes it easy to do a remix because you actually like you can actually negotiate to the point of no advance fees at all. You just literally split the sales on the track and everybody actually gets paid more because it's in your interest to push the track more, you know, because the person who did the remix gets got paid and they don't need to push the track so much. They, you know, they, they just they just go like, oh, my remix is out. Check it. Done. That's that's their promotion. Uh, whereas if everybody is involved in a split uh, situation via something like DistroKid or, or TuneCore, it um, it pushes you to kind of like um you know get uh get, give it a little bit more push because the more you push the track the more you get paid and, and the more everybody gets paid and it's good for you it's good for everybody so this is a very fair system and i've seen and i see it happening a lot in japan among young crew people up like you know below let's say 28 under 28 uh many especially in rap uh music hip-hop uh, it's all splits down to people who do the videos they get splits people who do the covers for jackets they get splits uh, i see labels that popping up that do splits so it's a very smart thing to do and do not and um one thing one one warning is that advance fees uh many people when they ask you for a remix they might offer you advance fees and it looks nice to get a boom, 1,000 euros, a boom, 2,000 euros or something. It looks nice. It feels nice to, to get that, you know, chunk of money right away. But think of your remix and your collaborations as a kind of a share in a stock, stock market. Because once it's out, it's always going to be bringing money, right? It's always there. So it's not, it doesn't give you 1,000 euros in one go unless your remix like it blew up. But it will keep on giving you more than thousand euros over a long period of time. And once you got like twenty, thirty remixes under your belt, and they all in split mode, you you know you you basically gain a salary, monthly set salary, monthly fee, of all your of your you know uh, cumulative work, which is of sales, not publishing. So publishing can often give you less than sales. It depends. It depends. But in my experience. Uh, if your music is not re- is not TV friendly, you know, s- sales give you more in- income than publishing. Uh, one thing that of w- one one another thing that you can expect is if the artist is really big, really famous, way above your level, but you're still trying to get their name on it because you want to push your own um, status, your your own plays, etc., etc. You you want you want to get more reach, you want to reach more audience, you want to reach their fans via their name by remixing your song they will most likely ask for a fee and a split and uh and it makes sense because obviously however the song blows up is going to be in big part due to their role to the to the, the to the to the work that they've put in and in, in getting their name out there so if it's worth it to you i mean you know it's um obviously do not work for exposure like ever but you do need exposure at some point, so you might get a smaller share 
uh, of income, but push your track further, and it will lead to more things uh, down the line. Contracts in my case, in my situation, I didn't come across so many contracts because uh, usually, I, I anybody who asked me personally for a remix, they were mostly friends and people I trust. I've come across contracts that were pretty light, and there's loads of contract uh, services templates online that you can find. Um, and uh, make sure you read uh, the contract, uh, the publishing side of the contract, because um, it's quite often the the publishing terms can be really, really, really long, <laughs> like like forty years or fifty years or something. And I feel I feel like uh, I think that ten years is like the more uh, common. At least in my experience, what I've seen, 10 years is the more common term for publishing. But some people just try to squeeze as much uh, publishing uh, stuff in there. Files. What to do with files and how to get the right files. Um, do you pr provide multi-tracks or do you provide stems? So stems are kind of groups of, like, let's say, drum group, synth, or let's say guitar group, piano group, vocal group, etc., etc. I found that uh if you're it depends it really depends on how you make your music let's uh, and i'm talking about you providing files so not the files that you receive obviously you just work with whatever you get from the artist but when you provide files um what you want to do is uh it really depends on how you produce so if you have like 300 tracks of like slight snippets of sounds and they make one hole just bounce that one hole as one hole um I don't mean the black hole, I mean like a one piece, you know, one thing. Uh, bounce that as one thing if it comes, uh, if it consists of 20 tracks. So do not give the artist 300 pieces of sound to sift through. Just make it easy for them. But you do want to give them drums separately because quite often people might want to use your kick or your snare, but change the rest, etc, etc. And you do want to give the very key elements separately. Uh, so I think if you if you're giving vocals, uh, main vocals separate from background vocals, obviously, um, uh, it it makes sense. Providing the dry vocal is also a smart thing, like maybe like less no reverb version of the vocal, just to because quite often the reverb might lock them into your feeling of the track, but dry vocal might give them something completely different to reinvent the track. Um, same for like main key elements like pianos or guitars or the main synths, whatever is the main part of the track. Uh, you want to provide that separately because that will kind of contribute to the track being a reinvention of the original. And they, don't, they do not have to destroy and struggle to try to get that main part out or even to, you know, replay it themselves. They might actually use the original sound. Should you provide MIDI? Uh, it depends if you really want them to play your exactly how you've played it. If 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 that's what you want, then provide MIDI, but it's not necessary. Most people have Melodyne or you know tools to exp to kind of get the melody out of the audio. So you know it's it's not necessary to provide MIDI. Um, should you remove mastering effects from the track? Uh, yes, because it will be mixed again. So obviously, if the track, if you mastered it yourself, you if you had a limiter on the track, remove that. Just give the you know quieter files, obviously, so because they will be working with them. Um, I feel like uh, when you want people to remix your stuff, you like like same with mixing and mastering files. Please name the files properly. Like, uh, properly named files and properly named folders is just courtesy. It's, it's common sense. Do not give people a folder full of uh, files that are called Audio 1, Audio 2, Audio 3, Audio 4, because it's... I mean, it's fine. It's a remix, right? So, obviously, they'll figure out what it is, but just naming your things in logical order makes sense, and it's polite. And being polite is a very important thing for artists because we are not really that polite. You know, we're, we're selfish. <laughs> <laughs> we're selfish people so you know try to be as polite as you can it makes sense uh remix no-nos uh do not just remix the hi-hats 
it's common sense, right? I mean, like, I know guys that are very proud of their work. Like, I did a remix, but I only used the hi-hats. Boom. I think it's kind of disrespectful because basically you're telling the artist, like, I don't like anything in your song. Like, I just... And if you only use the hi-hats, yeah, it's fine. You can do it, but why not just re release it as a u original song then? You know, like, um, so... You know, please use the part of the track that is recognizable so that it's a continuation of their work. And uh, I kind of feel like if 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 I ask somebody to remix my track and they literally only use my hat hats, I kind of feel like it's a diss. People might disagree, but like I will be like, oh, so you didn't like the track? Why did you agree to remix it? Should you? Can you put a vocalist on a remix? If if it makes this if 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 it's a song that didn't have vocals on it, but it had a melody that could really do well with vocals, and you put a vocalist on it, I think that might be really interesting. And I do I do not feel that's that's a, that's a no no. I think that's 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 ca that can be really cool to do a remix with a vocalist. You bring in a vocalist, but you have to check with the artists if they want the vocalist on it. Because if you brought somebody on that they hate. It's it's bad for the vocalist and it's bad for the artist, bad for everybody. So, uh, you obviously when you do a move like that, you want to check first. But it could be, it can be really cool. Um, can you remix a famous song legally? Uh, this is a really interesting one. There there are ways to do remix a famous song legally. Obviously, if it's not if the artist is not that it's not like Beyonce level, because obviously getting in touch with Beyonce is really hard. So, you know, you have to go through like 300 people before you ever get to her. But um, you can just hit people up and be like, hi, I'm me. This is me. And these are this is my work. And I would love to remix a song for free. And if you offer them to remix their song for free and then, you know, they get split of the sales, it's obviously free money for them. They have to do nothing. They just literally have to give you the files. So, you know, make it beneficial for them to, to get their stuff remixed and uh, you might be able to remix somebody famous, you know, but just contact them. Obviously, do not be annoying. They say no, do not keep on asking 300 times. But, uh, you know, if you if you do a good presentation, it's like a business opportunity, you know. Good presentation, uh, be polite, be nice and show your work. That might work. Another thing uh bootleg remixes right like so if you do a bootleg remix and you put that on spotify you can actually get banned and lose your spotify account uh you can also do a completely different name and put it on spotify but that will still get banned so no point right uh but one interesting hack that you can do is uh you need to check each song specifically whatever it is that you're remixing see if it already exists on on uh, youtube a remix by somebody else if it's if it exists and if you can hear it because uh youtube is interesting because youtube monetizes everything right so uh, if you put a song on youtube and uh it you might it will not get monetized on your account so you will not get money from the song the money will go to the original copyright owner of the song but the plays will remain in your account i think right like it, it i think it's case by case basis it depends on the actual copyright uh regulations for the song but what it does is that attracts people to to the to the you know to the youtube account because you're using the artist's name artist song and it'll get you plays, and it might get you noticed. And uh, I'm not recommending it because it, obviously it's illegal. But I know that uh, a few, f I know people that blow up off doing this. And the biggest uh, example of a miracle blow up is a guy called Imam Beck, who is a 19 year old kid from Kazakhstan who doesn't speak English. He literally just downloaded St. Jones's Roses a cappella off an illegal Russian speaking site called Kontakte, which is like a face, fake Facebook. Downloaded that, remixed that in two and a half hours, put it back on the same site. And it, because obviously on it, it, everything goes on, on, it's kind of like a, you know, it's a pirate site. So, but they have a community of people. It blew up in that community and, and it became, it took like a billion and a half view plays on Spotify. 
in 2019 or 20 i think and it was the biggest song like ever on on <laughs> i mean it's literally it, it was it got so many plays but the kid had no idea what's happening he and and what happened was that the original creators of the song uh saw an opportunity they're like oh we can we can get this remix uh we can get plays of it it's Saint John, uh, f- from what I've seen on his uh, Spotify, his I think his biggest song was like eighty million, and this remix is one billion three hundred million or something like that, right? So, by a kid from Kazakhstan who remixed it on a stereo speakers on his mum's computer, right? Who's never been to a club, like he he has no idea, and it's a club tune, and and you when you search it, Saint John, Ro- Saint John's Roses, when you hear it, you'll know it because it's literally been played everywhere. So you know there are opportunities in in bootleg remixes, obviously, uh, but be aware that it can get you banned, and if you actually release it, it can get you sued, and you don't want that. Another way, lastly, the legal way to remix stuff. There's a service that's uh, new, but I just uh, discovered it recently. It's called Tracklib. It's um, it's actually a sampling crate thing, but they have actual actual catalog of released music from the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s up until 2000s of uh, artists that li- agreed to have their music licensed out to be sampled, because. It's a really smart thing to get your music sampled. Quite often the sample, your music being sampled can give, can really actually increase the sales of the original song, right? Like, so a service called Tracklib, it costs from, I think, $6 a month to download five or six songs. But there's a caveat. This is not a, the $6 a month is only to download the songs, to remix them, but it's not a license to put it out. So you need to buy the license to release it separately. So you're allowed to remix it for your own enjoyment and pleasure. But if you actually want to put it out as an official, like, uh, and that goes to sampling or remixing, right? It, you can buy a license via that site for, I think, between $50, $50 to $1,500, the license to use the song in your original composition uh, as a remix or as a, you know, as as just a sample. And they will take splits depending on the licensing conditions. So there's three tiers. Go to their website. It's called tracklib. Uh, tracklib. dot com, I think, and uh, and figure it out. I hope this was useful information. This is it. I did a massive run through of uh, some remix trickery. I hope it helps. Thank you for listening. We also played the Silver Chord by Simone Jones and music by Slee. Don't forget to check out the Facebook group EXP to access the workshop PDF and discover new music. And thank you so much to all of our collaborators. Bulk Space in Detroit, 4 Culture Radio, the Goethe Institute in Chicago, Reboot FM, Your Moms in Berlin, and our main partner, Wunderbar, together. This was Hannah at Dublab. Bye for now. <laughs>